before we before I introduce Danielle and talk about uh, her work a little bit, let me ask uh, Rebecca as the GSA president if you would like to say anything to open this meeting. Hi, yeah. Um, so I just want to say that we're really happy we got to put this on again this semester. This is one of our um, pretty consistently uh, run workshops. We try to do it as often as we can. Um, and I just want to let you guys know that coming up in early December, we're also going to have a social event um, on campus. So keep an eye out for more information coming out about that soon. And how can they follow you on Facebook, Rebecca, if they want more information? So we have a Facebook page, a, an Instagram page, and a Twitter account. And those are all linked at the bottom of our website. So if you go to ualr.edu slash GSA, there are icons at the bottom to all of our social media pages. Thanks. And I just want to put in a plug while all of you are here for the GSA. Uh, now, many of you may be toward the end of your degrees at this point, and so your opportunities to participate will be uh, somewhat limited by your time. But for those of you who are kind of getting ahead of the game and getting a preview of the thesis process and you've still got one or more semesters left in your program, let me encourage you to get involved with GSA. First of all, you guys are all already members of the Graduate Student Association just by virtue of being graduate students at UA Little Rock. And the Graduate Student Association is your voice. So this is your opportunity to make heard uh, your needs, interests, and concerns about everything regarding your life at the university, from the classes that you take, to the graduate assistantship process, to policies uh, for the graduate school. We welcome your participation, uh, and it is through your participation that we can make your educational experience better. So we're really glad to see all of you here today, and we really want you to get involved and make your voices heard. Okay. So I began by introducing uh, Daniela Dehagani, who is the dis dissertation and thesis editor for the graduate school. When you send your thesis or dissertation manuscript to be reviewed after your defense, Daniela is the person who receives it first. Occasionally, uh, she is assisted by Nicole Godfrey, uh, but Daniela is handling most of the stuff. So Daniela is here to kind of chip in periodically and talk about typical mistakes or questions that she gets in that role, and also to give you an opportunity to meet her so that you know there's a real human being who receives these projects. And she is happy to talk to you before you send the stuff to her. So if you have questions and you would like to get an advanced start, she knows everything that I'm gonna be presenting in this workshop, and you can make appointments with her, you can call her up, uh, she is happy to help you. That makes both your job easier and her job easier when you are in contact with her. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about your deadlines for defending your manuscript and getting it submitted for the formatting check. Our submission deadlines are the same every single semester. They are always December 1st for fall, May 1st for spring, or August 1st for summer. Uh, and the time that we need your email with your manuscript in it is 5 p.m. on those dates. Now, the only exception to this rule is that if the first day of the month falls on a Saturday or Sunday, then the defense and submission deadline gets moved to the following Monday. This semester, that's not an issue. December 1st falls on a Wednesday. So there will be no exceptions to the Wednesday at 5 p.m. It's got to be defended. It's got to be in our hands by 5 p.m. You'll email your manuscript to this email address right here on your screen. And again, this will be in the handout. So if you don't have anything to take notes, don't worry. Uh, the GSA will send this handout to you. Grad TD, that's thesis and dissertation, grad TD review at ualr.edu. And that address connects directly to Daniela. So if you want to send her questions, that's a great place to do it. You can reach her anytime, not just during the, the actual deadlines. Okay, the guidelines that we're going to show you are located in the dissertation and thesis guidelines PDF, uh, which is on our website. Let me see if I can actually switch over and show you this website or if I'm gonna have to stop sharing and reshare. 
Uh, let's do this and do this. Can you see the graduate school website? Okay, I'm gonna have to stop share and reshare. I guess it's not gonna follow me from application to application. Okay, do you now see the graduate school website? Excellent, okay. So to find everything that you need in terms of the guidelines, you're gonna click on this second link at the top of our page that says current students. And then you're gonna come down here on this first little menu box to the second to the bottom link, thesis and dissertation information. And a lot of the stuff that, we've that we're gonna talk about here is located on this page, but probably the single most important piece of information is this very first link in the first paragraph. You should read the dissertation and thesis guidelines. You click it and it takes you to this PDF. Everything we're, we're gonna cover, everything that is in this little book, in this workshop, and you'll always be able to get this online. So don't worry that it says it's 2018, 2019. We haven't made any updates to it since then. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the process of formatting check. First of all, once you email your manuscript to us, and I recommend that you do this almost immediately after your defense. So even if, so even though the deadline isn't until December 1st, if you defend any time this November, as soon as you finish your defense, go ahead and send us the manuscript for formatting check, even if your committee still has some changes that they would like you to make. Because our, the things we're gonna check for, like your margins, your spacing, your headings, if you've got the formatting right, that's probably not going to change. Uh, yeah, Daniela says, please send your thesis or dissertation ASAP. Yes, that's absolutely true because of what we're about to say here, which is that it may take anywhere from 48 hours to a couple of weeks for you to get your comments back from us when you submit them. Uh, and that's because Daniela is doing all of the commenting and she's only one person. There's only so fast that she can get it back to you. Now, Nicole will help out when she can, but she can't always help out. So. The closer you submit to the deadline, because more people are submitting at that time, the longer it's going to take to get the comments back. Now, I want to assure you up front that no matter how long it takes for you to get comments back for us, that does not affect your graduation date. So please do not email Daniela over and over again saying, why haven't you got my comments back? Uh, She'll get to your comments as quickly as she possibly can, and it's not going to keep you from graduating. As long as you defended before the deadline and you submitted your manuscript for formatting check, you will graduate that semester. Do you have any questions about that point? Or about these deadlines? Okay, good. We'll continue. So once you've submitted it to the Review TD uh, at, or the thesis, yeah, what is it? Grad TD Review at UALR.edu, uh, then either Daniela or Nicole will contact you to let you know if changes are needed to comply with the thesis and dissertation guidelines. Uh, please understand there's no judgment involved in that. Like you guys are mentally very tired <laughs> after you complete your dissertation and thesis process. So we do not expect it to be perfect. And again, it not being perfect does not keep you from graduating. However, you do have to make these changes. You can't just send it in and say, hey, I sent it in, it's done. Uh, if you do not make these changes, your degree will post to your transcript, but we will put a transcript hold on your account and you will not be able to get copies of your transcript or your diploma until you have successfully uploaded your thesis and dissertation, which cannot be done until you pass formatting check. So please respond quickly to them when they send back the comments, make the changes. You don't get to argue about the changes. <laughs> you make the changes and then you can immediately upload your manuscript to ProQuest. You do not have to send it back to us. So you'll see here in the handout, there's a link that you can click where you can do the upload process. The upload process is free. 
Now, if you encounter any links on the ProQuest site that ask you to pay for anything, understand that is not required. So you can decline anything that it asks you to pay for. It's a totally free process. Now, once you've submitted the manuscript to ProQuest, the dissertation formatting editor and your committee chair will review it to ensure that all changes were made. So they're gonna ask Daniela, did you, they change the things you asked them to change and she has to sign off. They're gonna ask your committee chair, did they make the changes that the committee asked for? And the committee chair has to sign off. If either Daniela or the committee chair says no, you haven't fi finished this process and you will still have a transcript hold on you. When both the editor and your advisor approve the manuscript, your transcript hold will be removed and that's what enables you to receive your diploma and to get copies of your transcript that show the degree. And then the last part of this process is your diploma usually arrives six to eight weeks after your commencement ceremony, assuming of course that your upload was approved. You'll wanna make sure that your mailing address is correct in BOSS when you graduate, otherwise they will send it to the wrong place, which is not super helpful. Uh, and if any of you have name changes, now is the time to make your name change uh, go through in BOSS, because otherwise it will put on your diploma whatever your name is in BOSS. If you do not like how your name is in BOSS, now is the time to get that changed. Now the good news, you are not required to have your thesis or dissertation bound. It used to be required of all folks, but the uh, uploading to ProQuest has taken the place of that. So that means, again, that process is free to you. You don't have to pay any money and you don't have to get it bound at all. However, if you want to get it bound, because let's face it, it looks really nice in that hard cover, especially when you put all that work into it. And you know, the parents are always very impressed by the bound copy. So, you know, my thesis was huge. And uh, when they see it and it's a real thing, that is an impressive thing. So you might want to bind your thesis. If you do, the cost is approximately $20 per copy. And the way that you do it is this. You pay for the binding at the cashier's office in the student services center. So you go to their office and you say, I want to pay to have my thesis or dissertation bound, you give them the $20 for however many copies of it you want. And then here's the obnoxious part, you bring hard copies of your project and your receipt showing you paid for it to our offices on the fifth floor and we will ship them to the bindery. I am so sorry for this. I do not understand why the bindery will not just take your PDF like that. Seems like that would be so much easier. But no, they make us ship actual printed pages to us. Uh, be aware too that, you know, if you're printing someplace where there's a page limit and your thesis is long, that could be a problem. So plan that out. But the good news is you can actually have that bound whenever there's no deadline on the binding. So you could do that after graduation if you wanted to, and you would still get the same price. So we'll ship them to the bindery and we will email you when the bound copies are returned to us. Now here's the, the scary, this process usually takes four weeks. However, our bindery has sent us an email saying that they are short staffed due to the pandemic. And so they are now taking longer than four weeks so just be aware it could take a while, but you don't have to do anything. As soon as that sucker comes in, we'll email you saying your copies are ready to pick up. Or if, you need, if you've left the state and you need us to ship them to you, we can do that too. That's not a problem. You may hire an editor to help with sentence level editing, including grammar, punctuation, and formatting. Now it is your responsibility to ask your advisor uh, whether or not this is acceptable. So some disciplines are okay with this, other disciplines are not. My discipline, obviously I'm in the professional and technical writing program, is not okay with this because we feel, you know, if you're a student in our program, you should be able to do your own editing. But like if you're in the science and technology field and English isn't your first language, your advisor may be 100% okay with it because they're testing your ability to be a scientist, not your ability to punctuate in English. 
So if you're in a program where it where it's allowed for you to hire an editor, first of all, understand they don't work for the university. They are freelance editors. You have to contact them, negotiate their rate with them. They know your students, so they're going to try to keep it reasonable. But also understand some projects take more work from them than others, depending on how long they are, how much correction they need, you know, whether it's just formatting, whether it's also sentence level editing. So their rates may vary. Uh, so in the handout that you get from GSA at the end of this workshop, you'll have the contact information for three editors who have said they are interested in taking clients. And then it's up to you to first make sure that your advisor is okay with that and second contact them for possible rates. All right, so here's a little nine page handout. And what I'm gonna do for the remainder of this workshop is walk you step by step through the things in this handout with an actual Word document that will let us simulate what your thesis is like. Uh, so don't worry if I don't always show this handout. This handout exists. It outlines exactly the steps that we're gonna cover here and you'll be able to look at it. And then two, if you get lost on one of these, Daniela can always ch chime in and help you. She is an expert on how to get this formatting right. Okay, so let's start with these first steps. So number one, you're gonna set your margins. Most of you are gonna set your uh, margins to one inch all the way around, and that's perfect for ProQuest's purposes. If, however, you want to get your thesis bound, please set the left margin to 1.5 inches instead of one. That extra half an inch leaves place for the physical binding where it's gonna crimp it and still leaves you a good margin on your left-hand side. Okay, here's one of the most confusing parts of the dissertation and thesis formatting process, which is creating your front matter. I have created this little table for you that summarizes several pages that's actually in the guidebook because by the time you read the guidebook, like your head is like, what do they want me to do? It's so, there's so much. So basically here's what the guide is saying to you. There are some pieces of the front matter that you are required to have. And there are some pieces of the front matter that are optional for you to have. And then on top of that, there are some pieces of the front matter that are supposed to have page numbers. And there are some pieces of the front matter that are not supposed to have page numbers. And so I'm gonna talk you through this little table that explains it, all right? So everything above this little dotted line here is you count these pages, but you don't put page numbers on them, okay? And you can create these pages immediately. Uh, and we're gonna walk through how to do them correctly. These pages that I have here in bold, all of them are required. You must have a title page, you must have a copyright page, a signature page, your fair use page, and your abstract. Each of them are just one page. You are allowed to have a dedication. So if you want to dedicate this in the memory of a family member, for example, or in uh, the memory of a teacher who was very influential to you, you're allowed to do that. You're not required though. If you wanna have an acknowledgements page where you thank all the people that contributed to the project, uh, you're allowed to do that, but you're not required. If so, they go in this order. The dedication goes right after the abstract. The acknowledgements goes after the dedication. And then last but definitely not least, if you had to get a protocol approval for your project, so if you had to file out, fill out paperwork for IRB approval, which means you had human subjects in your uh, project, if you did any animal research, or if you did anything with uh, biohazardous materials, then you are required to put your protocol approvement uh, as a page here uh, either right after the abstract or if you have the dedication and acknowledgements right after that. So the protocol approval statement is the last page before your table of contents. And none of these pages that are in this part of the list have page numbers on them, even though you're gonna count them for the purposes of putting the page numbers on later. Again, I'm sorry for this. I have no idea why that's true. Like it makes no sense. 
It is nevertheless what ProQuest expects. Once we get to the below the little dotted line, these are going to have page numbers. You are going to put these page numbers in little Roman numerals in the bottom center of the page. Okay, so here, no page numbers. Here, little Roman numerals in the center bottom of the page. So as you can see, depending on how many of these pages you have that come before it, your table of contents might be little Roman numeral six. If you have, if this is one, two, three, four, five, counted but not page numbered, then table of contents is little Roman numeral six. If you have, if you add any of these pages, obviously it's later depending on how many of them there are. So if you add a protocol approval statement, now table of contents is little Roman numeral seven. Yeah, Terry, you'll definitely get a, a copy of this. Um, okay, so you're required to have a table of contents. And then as before, you may have other things after the table of contents, depending on your project. If you have figures or illustrations in your project, you must have a list of the figures or illustrations. So that's almost like a little table of contents just of the graphics in your project. If you have tables of data in your project, you have to have a separate table of contents for them. Uh, you're allowed also to have a list of symbols, abbreviation, and nomenclature if you want to. Uh, and you are not required to have a preface if you, unless you want to. If you do, here's where it goes. So again, depending on how long these things are, you could have as many as like, you know, little Roman numeral 10 in your front matter, depending on how long the table of contents is and how many pages you need for each of these additional figures. But remember, if you don't have any graphics in your project, if you don't have any tables, then those are not required. You can just skip right over them. So here is a sample uh, thesis document where it's actually partly filled out. And again, we will email you the electronic copy of this so that all you'll have to do is go in and type over this stuff. And you won't have to worry about like how many spaces does it need to be between the title and where it says a thesis submitted. Like all of this is already set up so it would pass the formatting check. So that'll save you a little bit of time. Now, as I go through here, I'm going to talk about some of the common uh, mistakes that people make as they fill this out. And Daniela will also chime in uh, because she's seen it all. Like there, there is no problem that you can have with these pages that she hasn't seen. So uh, we're happy to talk you through this. All right. So the very first thing is you're going to type the complete title of your thesis or dissertation here, and you're going to put it in all caps. So. Okay, so my brilliant dissertation, three years of blood and tears. Uh, and now you go on, this is a place where you'll have to watch because it depends on which project you're doing. If you're doing a thesis, you can leave this line alone. If you're doing a dissertation, make sure you change the word thesis to dissertation. Like so. In partial fulfillment of the degree of the requirements for the degree in, you don't actually have to do anything there. Here it says, type the full degree title in all caps, okay? So you need to check and make sure that you know what the full title of your degree is. Uh, so for example, in my program, it is Master of Arts. And notice I don't say anything about what it's the Masters of Arts in. So if your degree is MA in X or MS in X, you type out Master of Arts or Master of Science in what is your program. So in this case, oops, it's not all caps there at that point. Like so. Okay, and I already have a question for Daniela. So Daniela, if we have any social work people in the audience, do they type master of social work in social work or do they just type it the one time? 
That seems kind of repetitive to me. Right? Have, have you done a social work? Well, actually, I guess social work doesn't do a thesis, do they? Mm -mm. So maybe it's a moot point. I, I don't recall doing one, but I, I would probably tell them to take it out. Okay. And that's another great thing. If you're not sure, again, pop your question over to Daniela. She's happy to give you some guidance. Okay. So now here's another place to watch out. This is true for the people in my program. So it's the Master of Arts in Professional and Technical Writing in the Department of Rhetoric and Writing. So notice that in my case, my department name is different than my program name. So you need to check just in case your program name and your, I mean, maybe they're the same, but maybe they're different. So make sure you get the right one. And in the College of, thankfully, there are only three colleges it could possibly be anymore. <laughs> so uh, in my case, it's going to be in the College of Arts. Or nope, so, sorry, I'm seeing I'm already wrong. College of Humanities, <laughs> Arts, Social Sciences, and Education. Okay, so that's Chase, C-H-A-S-S-E, okay? So you will either be in Chase, DC STEM, or uh, C-B-H-H-S. The people who are most commonly confused about this are the people in counseling, uh, because for whatever reason, you guys are not in social sciences, you guys are in uh, C-B-H-H-S. Uh, Jan asks, do you need the serial comma? Optional in this particular case. I personally would prefer the serial comma, but does not matter. Uh, other questions about that so far or about which college you belong to? Okay. Continue. Also, oh, go ahead. I was yeah, just no. going to add something real quick. Some people aren't aware that their college names have changed. And you can yes. find that on the website. Um, but if anyone has questions, I can email you a copy of every college name and subject. Yeah, thank you. That's super helpful. And Rebecca says, for DC STEM, do you write out Donahue? Yeah, you do. So, so you'll say, in the, of the, in the Department of Rhetoric and Writing of the Donahue College of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Great question. Okay, notice as we're down here in these sections, this is showing you that when we italicize something, nothing in this is italicized. So please take, or I think very little of this is italicized. Take out the italics in most cases. We're just showing you that you need to fill this in and uh, that it is mixed case. So you'll see upper and lower case. So I'm gonna take that out. And it says type the month and year of graduation. So again, there are only three options here. For those of you who are graduating this semester, the correct answer is December, 2021. If you're in the spring, it'll be May, 2022. If you're in the summer, it'll be August, 2022. Does not matter when you actually defend it. What matters is your graduation date. Okay, on this line it says type your full name as it appears on university records. If you are not sure, go log into BOSS and find out what name is there for you. For me, it has all three, my first name and my middle name and my last name. So you're required to put it exactly the way that it is in BOSS. And that's why I said, if you don't like the way that it is in BOSS, go get that sucker changed now. And then the last line on this page, type your previous degrees, awarding institutions, and conferral years here. So I would type, for example, like if this were really my PhD, then I would type BA, University of Utah, 1991, followed by MA, University of Utah, 1993, for however many degrees you happen to have. For some of us, this is shorter or longer than others. 
Okay, any questions about any of that or Daniela, anything that you would like to comment on that people struggle with on this first page? Yeah, a lot of people will spell out or write out the degree. It always needs to be abbreviated and nothing extra needs to be put in um, that specific section, except for if you graduated and got a degree from out of the country, maybe you would wanna be a little more specific. Yeah, so you can add you can add the country that it comes from after the university. So let's say that you got your uh, degree in India, for example, you could add it like that. Good point. Anybody else have a question or see something that you're not sure how this would apply to your project? Okay, let's move on to page two, which thankfully is much easier than page one. Okay, here we are on the copyright page. You have only two things to type here. Your name as it appears in university records. And the year of your degree, which if you're this semester, it's 2021. And the spacing on every page needs to be exactly how these formatting examples are. Some yep, so are notice this is single space, there's no extra spaces. Good point, Danielle. Mm -hmm. Okay, scrolling on, next page. Here is probably the most frequently screwed up page in this whole front matter, which is your thesis advisor and committee, which you wouldn't think would be that easy to screw up, and yet it is. All right, so this thesis, notice this time the thesis is in mixed case. So, uh, remember, if you're doing a dissertation, you've got to change this from thesis, so I'm going to change it to dissertation because I'm pretending that I'm doing a dissertation. Okay, make sure that you leave the quotation marks in my brilliant quotation years of my Tears, comma, quotation mark, by your full name as it appears in university records. Is approved by the following. Okay. Now, first of all, uh, back in the old days when we did stuff in paper, uh, your committee would actually sign these things. They are not actually going to sign anything here. So don't put signature lines in. All you want to do is put in their names and their titles. So you're going to put in, start with the full name of your thesis advisor. They can Notice put the signature lines. It just needs to be blank. Right, right. Because what we don't want to do, we do not want to put physical, we don't want to put images of people's signatures in ProQuest. That's like asking for identity theft. They won't even let us take them. So don't, don't send us any signatures. Notice that when I'm putting my thesis advisor's name in here, that I don't put doctor, I don't put PhD, I don't put anything. I put her first name and her last name, and that is it. And then I can erase this out. So this little thing here is just to remind you that you're only supposed to put their name. Okay, the next thing it asks for is their academic rank and department, okay? This is not the same as their job title. This is their academic rank. So no matter if Janice Lauer is the chair of my department. I do not list her that way. I list her according to her academic rank. So she is, would be a professor of rhetoric and writing. And that's it. Okay. So I don't like, for example, if she is the chair or if she directs the writing center, I don't put that in. Uh, I don't put that somebody is the graduate coordinator. I only put what their academic rank is. Now, you may not know what their academic rank is, and therefore it is your responsibility to ask either them or your graduate coordinator what is the correct rank to put in there. Because it's not, you know, sometimes they don't list it on the web page, and even when they do, sometimes the web page is out of date. It's always good and correct to check the spelling of their name, because I mean, that's also super not a good way to get on your 
committee's you know good side if you misspell their names that that feels kind of insulting and make sure you get their ranks correct or if you're going to make a mistake on their rank you better promote them because <laughs> you want to flatter them if at all possible and then you're going to follow that pattern for the rest of your committee members so for example if uh the next person on my committee is george jensen Actually, let me do somebody who's not a full professor. Let me do uh, Londi Martin. I'm just going to cut in here real quick. Please do. So if it's a, and I know I'm, I'm only saying this because you're doing it right now. So I feel like a lot of other people will do it too. If it's a dissertation, it's dissertation all the way down. That's right. Yes, yeah, so you've got to make sure and change these things. And it's so easy to forget that they're there. Thank you, Daniela. And same for every other page, because there's going to be a few more pages that come up that you'll have to change all of that on to. Yep, that is exactly right. Okay, now let's let's take a couple of unusual cases for committee members. All right, what if you have a committee member who is not a professor at UALR? Let's say they're a professor somebody somewhere else. All right, so here's how we'll list them. First thing we'll do is we'll put their name like normal and we'll list their rank. And then we'll list their affiliation like so, okay? So if there's nothing under the person's academic rank, we're gonna assume they're here at UA Little Rock. If you add an extra university, then we know that there's somebody from off campus and some of you are required to have an off campus dissertation committee member. So that's an important thing to know. Another situation that you might encounter is okay, what if you have an off campus committee member, but that person is not a professor, what if they're not at any university. And that frequently happens in my program because we have workplace professionals who are qualified to serve as thesis committee members. So for example, if you were to use, uh, let's say Allison Nicholas, and she is a recruiting director. Or you do the same thing. What's that? Uh, so a bunch of these uh, people have questions and I, I think you would all just put them under your dissertation thesis committee. I would put those people on that section, especially the one with the co-advisor. Why do you have a co-advisor? Because sometimes you have uh, people who are sharing. And so you would add, so you would list dissertation advisor and then the next and thing would be co dissertation co-advisor. Yep, that's right. Uh, for those of you, if you, somebody, uh, Terry asked, what if your committee member is retired from UALR? So then that, changes their rank. So let's say, let's pretend Dr. Lauer uh, was at UALR and that she had retired. Uh, so I would change this to Professor Emerita of Rhetoric and Writing. So it's the last title they held while they were here and you add the word Emerita, which indicate, or Emerita for a woman, Emeritus for a man. So let's say, let's pretend that Dr. Ebel is retired he would be Professor Emeritus of English, like so. And uh, Acadia, did I answer your question about the readers who are outside of academia? Okay, good. All right, I think that covers most of the cases. Does anybody else have a case that does not, that we have not covered in this example? I will put in one minor note that a lot of people don't know about, but that Daniela will also appreciate, uh, which is you should ask your committee chair and or your program coordinator to make sure that the people who have agreed to serve on your committee have graduate faculty status. Because this is another thing that can screw people's graduation up is if we get to your defense and it turns like this frequently happens particularly for like, in this case, Ebel and Nicholas, 
if it's somebody from a, another university, uh, they have to actually apply to have graduate faculty status here. Uh, same thing for people who are not affiliated with academia. They have to submit a form, the department chair needs to sign it, and we need to have a copy of their resume so that we can make sure they're qualified to serve. I actually embarrassingly had this happen on a committee where the person was at UALR, where I was like, I'm like, there's no way the Department of Nursing would not have had graduate faculty status for this person, but they didn't. And that held up that person's graduation. So please, as you're doing that last little checklist of things, make sure that all your folks have graduate faculty status. There's no way for you to look it up. Your, in fact, really your program coordinator has gotta be the person that you ask about that because he or she is the only person uh, who's able to look up the graduate faculty status. I have something else to say. Please do. Um, on graduate dean, Brian yes. Berry is always the associate professor of chemistry. That is true. So a lot of people will, will put him as something else and he is just always associate professor of chemistry. Yep, you don't even have to touch anything on that line when we send you this form, just don't even type anything else there. You don't list, you don't have to put he's Dean of the Graduate School because the form already says that he is. So, uh, and you know, he is still an associate professor. He has not gone up for promotion to full professor. Now, here's a common question. People like, well, what if my program coordinator is already on my committee? Do I have to list them twice? The answer is yes. Yes, you do. <laughs> okay, so whoever your coordinator is, for the whole program, in our case, it's Heidi Harris. Donna, are they still affiliated with UALR? I don't think so, but she was here and then she went to another university and I'm going to, she's going to be my outside person. Yeah, Donna, you definitely uh, credit her to her current affiliation. And let's make sure too, while we're at it, that we have changed her to the correct graduate faculty status. So when she was here, she had full graduate faculty status. Now that she's gone, she should be affiliate status. Although that at least won't hold up your graduation if there's that problem. Okay, thank you. Excellent question. Okay, that is pretty much all I need to tell you about this page. Do you have questions that we have not covered here? Oh, um, at the top part, uh-huh. I was going to say this earlier. Um, so even though we give you the copy, people often rush and try to like copy paste it real fast. The commas are very important. The quotation marks are very important. The Correct. comma after your name is very important. The, the colon is important. All of these little things are super important. Uh, Zoya, the program coordinator is your graduate coordinator. Good question. Yeah, so and it is the graduate coordinator, not the not the chair of the department, for example. So I would so if you're in my program, you would not list Dr. Carter here. You list Dr. Harris because she's the graduate coordinator. These are great questions. Do you have any other questions before we move off this page? Because as Danielle and I have both noted, whether it's the punctuation, whether it's the people's names, whether it's their ranks, this is the single most screwed up page for formatting check. So if you can get this one right, the rest question. of it is easier. <laughs> Sorry, ahead. I have another question. Go ahead. Uh, so I was concerned uh, in the dissertation title that you've written, you've put a comma before the quote, quotation ends. Is this the way or do we write, do we put the comma after the quotation? No, the comma goes the inside the quotation mark, please. Okay, thank you. Excellent question, thank you. A lot of people are confused by that too. It's yep. not just you. Which, by the way, there's a logical reason for you to be confused about this. Did you know that it is the American style to put the comma inside the quotation mark, but the British style to put it outside the quotation mark? So if you have seen them outside quotation marks, you're not crazy and they weren't necessarily wrong, but that's the British style. And of course, just because we feel like being different, the United States has to do it differently. <laughs> Any other questions before I move off this page? You're welcome, Zoya. 
All right, scrolling on. Another easy page. The fair use thing, you don't have to type anything here. Just leave that in right the way it is. This duplication part, you just need to decide which of these you agree to. So that one of them says that if somebody wanted to get a physical copy of your dissertation from the library, like I have no idea who that would be, but if somebody did, do you allow it to be photocopied and sent to them or not? I see no point in refusing to have this copy, to allow the copy because they could just get it off ProQuest anyway. Yep. Nobody will ever do this, but uh, but it's your right to, to refuse or not. So if you want to give them permission to make the copy, just delete this whole part. And then Daniela, do they type their name here or do they just leave it like this? So what I understood, and I could be wrong, but from what I understood, when I had when I asked Nicole about this, you want to give them permission. Right because for binding purposes. Right. So, but what so, I'm asking is on this signature part, like obviously I- Yeah, you know, they leave like, it blank. They leave it blank? Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. But you want to make sure that you you keep the signature part and the, and the line there. You don't want to delete that. Okay, good. And now then if, there's a dissertation and a thesis words that need to be swapped out accordingly. Oh, too. yep, you're sure right. Good catch. Here's thesis. And I would have skipped right over that. It's on the fair use part too. You sure are correct. I'm so glad you caught that. Yeah, see, I've been doing these workshops for like over 10 years and I still miss this stuff. I'm like, yeah, I can just roll right over this. But Daniela's going to send me an email if I send this to her that way. So, all right. Any questions about that page? That's literally all there is. Change thesis to dissertation and if it applies to you, thesis to dissertation if it applies to you, get rid of either the authorized <laughs> or the authorized thing. All right. So now we're almost home free on the required pages. We're to the abstract. Type the full title of your thesis and dissertation. Notice, leave this stuff bold. It's bolded here and it needs to stay bold. Okay, leave that comma in. Oops, let me not erase by either while I'm at it. And not all caps. And graduation date. Okay. Then notice that whereas in previous sections we've been doing single spacing, here we go to double space for the abstract. Uh, Daniela, do you know if these word limits still apply? Does anybody uh, you care whether they're- You don't want to make it longer. I think me and Nicole were like eyeballing it. Usually people don't write a whole lot, so it's okay. Right. The thing that I would encourage all of you to think about with respect to your abstracts is, okay, yes, then get your stuff in the ballpark of these word limits. Uh, but remember that this is what people are gonna to use to decide whether or not they read your thesis or dissertation. So what's gonna happen is they're gonna get on the ProQuest database, they're gonna type in some keywords. And if your project comes up, most of them are gonna look at the abstract and decide whether to read the rest of it. So do not leave out information that is critical to the project in the abstract. Otherwise they won't know enough about what you talked about. I recommend for dissertations, for example, that you have like, a sentence that kind of summarizes each chapter or a sentence or two, if you can fit it within the 350 words. Uh, yeah, Rebecca, you were talking about finding the thesis and dissertation stuff. So that's a great point. Okay, that's pretty much all I have to say about the abstract pages. So make sure you take the little brackets off, make sure everything stays double spaced, otherwise you're done.
Okay. I'm going to stop the share for a sec. And I'm going to switch over to back to our handout that kind of gives us the map of where we're going here. All right, so I just showed you all of these pages except the ones that aren't required. Now, if you've got a protocol approval statement, then you need to either like take a screenshot of that and stick that in the next page of the Word document or if you know how to use Acrobat DC to merge pages out of a PDF, you can put it in later. Uh, but either way, you've got, if you had a protocol approval, you've got to put it there. Okay, now here's something that's a little bit counterintuitive. So the next page would be ordinarily the table of contents. And I'm gonna suggest to you that you should not type First of all, no, you should never manually type your table of contents if you can possibly help it. And the reason is, how time consuming is that? Like when you have to keep flipping back and forth between like, all right, this heading was on this page and now here's the next subheading and it's on that page. Oh, wait, your committee required revisions. Now the headings have moved to different pages and you have to go back and redo all of that. That's hugely time consuming. If you will take the little bit of extra time that for the to do it differently, the way that I'm about to show you, you can automatically create your table of contents with a single click. And from there on out, you can automatically update it with a single click. And it will all be, it will always be lined up the way that it's supposed to be. It will just save you ridiculous, ridiculous amounts of time. So what I'm about to show you is takes a little bit of extra thought but will save you time in the long run. First, what we're gonna do, so right here, I have put in a bunch of paragraphs with headings uh, using nothing but the regular defaults in Word. So one of the things that I want you to notice right away is that the default line spacing in Word is not double space. You actually have to make it double space your paragraphs. All right, so let me show you how to do that just in case you're not familiar. All right, we are gonna take all this stuff. And we're gonna come over here to layout. And you see the little paragraph box here and you see now in this dialog box that comes up for paragraph that under line spacing it says what this version of words default is which is multiple at 1.15 that is not double space now depending on your version of word you might find that it's multiple at 1.08 whatever you've still got to change this all right notice there are two things actually that i have to change it's set to do an automatic 10 point space after the paragraph i don't want that you want to do, click the little down arrow and change that to zero and i want to change the line spacing to double like so notice down in the little preview you can see whether it's going to do it right i'm going to click ok all right so now you are correctly spaced all the way through your body text. Okay, the next thing that we're gonna do is we're going to apply, we're gonna do what's called applying styles to your headings. What this is doing is it's just putting a little tag in the coding of Microsoft Words so that Word knows where your headings are. And this is what's going to help it auto-generate your table of contents for you. On top of that, it's going to format them for you so that instead of you having to go, all right, my heading one is always gonna be like 16 point bold Cambria, once you do this, you can define them and just apply that style over and over again, which is great because if your thesis or dissertation advisor tells you they want you to change the style of the formatting, you can then do that afterwards with a single click instead of having to go and reformat every freaking heading in your document. Let me show you what I mean. All right, so I'm going to go back to the home tab. And I want to make this rhetorical theory applied to workplace situations my first level heading. So I'm going to highlight it. 
And you'll notice right here in the top middle of my toolbar is a section called styles. And lo and behold, there is a style called heading one. And look, I can click on that sucker and it immediately applies it. All right, that's nice. Although one of the notice that it just messed up my spacing. So that's a little bit irritating. If you don't like or the formatting is wrong when you get your when you apply your heading one, let me show you how to modify it. So uh, I can go up here to the heading one and I'm going to right click on it and I'm going to modify the style. And the first thing I'm going to do, let's say I don't want it to be Arial. Let's say I want my headings to be Cambria. And then let's say I don't want it to close up the spacing. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to click format and I'm going to come down to paragraph. And hey, look, there's why it's screwing up the spacing. It's making it uh, like 24 point space before it was like, why would you want that? I don't understand why that's the default. So I'm going to turn that to zero. And then I'm going to change the line spacing to double again, just like the rest of my manuscript and hit OK and OK. And now it's right again. All right. Does that part make sense so far? So all we did was we formatted that one heading one. And now what's great is that when we apply the heading one style to any other heading ones in the document, we can do that with a single click. We never have to go back and fix those paragraph thingies ever again. Okay, so now here's a second, here's another subheading. This one is gonna be a level two to show that this is a section of this part about rhetorical theory. All right, so let's say for this one, first thing I'm gonna do, so I'm gonna select heading two. You notice it's already screwing with the spacing again. No big deal. I click the heading two, I right click, modify. I'm going to change this to Cambria. I'm going to keep it at the 11 point format paragraph, take out that extra space, change the line spacing to double. Okay. Okay. Boom. All right. That's much better. All right. Now watch how cool this becomes. So now as I scroll further down my text, you see here's my next heading two. And now all I have to do to format it is boom, click heading two, does all the formatting for us. Keep on scrolling. I feel like I have another heading in here somewhere. Oh, here it is. Mastering the art of rhetoric. I have another one hiding in here somewhere. Nope, I guess I don't. All right, so let's pretend this one is a heading one. So I highlight it, click on the heading one, boom, there it is. So again, that's gonna make it super easy for you to go through your document and format all your headings consistently. But now, now is where the real magic happens because now we're gonna create a table of contents. Oh. Uh -oh. All right, so here's how we do this. Okay, you're gonna go back to this page where your very first body text occurs. So you're, you're after the abstract, you're on this page where the thesis body text starts. And I put my cursor at the top of the page. And then I come here to the references tab. And I'm going to come here to, to the very first thing on the left-hand side, which is table of contents. Okay, I'm going to choose, for the sake of argument, automatic table two, and click that. And whoa, lo and behold, there is a table of contents. Now, it's not on a page by itself yet. And it's the page numbers are wrong because we haven't put the right page numbers in yet. but Look at how beautiful it is. Look, there's your headings all out to the left-hand margin. There's your subheadings. They're all nicely indented. Your dot leaders, like I never want to find any of you typing period, 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 period to connect your stuff to your page numbers. You never have to do that. Plus it'll never line up right if you do it that way. If you do it this way, those suckers are already in there. Uh, and they're all lined up. They're all lined up to the margin perfectly. All right, now, that we've got that there, 
let's put our cursor in the table right where it is again at the top of that first heading and let's break this over to the next page. So I'm going to do insert, page break, boom. Now our table of contents is living on its correct page and the thesis starts where it's supposed to. We're halfway home, babies. Now all we got to do is put these page numbers in and make them work right. All right, so here's the next fun part. We're going to set up the, the page numbering for the front matter. Okay, so remember the tricky part. None of this stuff from the abstract back is supposed to have any page numbers on it at all. And the table of contents is supposed to have a page number that's a little Roman numeral that's in the bottom of the page. All right, so the first thing that we've got to do is set up page numbers in the bottom of the page. So I scroll to the bottom of my table of contents. And I'm going to double click down here close to the bottom of the page so it'll open my footer. So you'll see this little footer section here. And the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to come up here and insert and add page number. So I'm up here in the left hand corner. You see header, footer, page number. I want a page number at the bottom of the page. And we're going to do, we're going to center it. So we're going to put plane number two. All right, so far so good, except, oops, that was supposed to be a little Roman numeral. Yes, Terry, it, it is just like Google Docs, so it will apply uh, heading style changes all the way through, which is one of the beautiful things about styles. Okay, so now I've got to get this changed to little Roman numerals. So I double click the six and I come back to page number and I'm gonna do format page numbers. And then notice the very first thing it asks me here is number format. I click that little down arrow and I change it. There's the little Roman numerals, the last one, like so. Uh, yes, we're gonna continue from the previous section and okay. All right, so you see both a good thing and a bad thing happened. Now we've got little Roman numerals. That's great. The problem is, is now we've got little Roman numerals on everything. And so now we've got to get rid of them on the pages that we don't want them on. And we've got to get them, and we've got to get rid of them on the pages that come after the table of contents. So here's where things get a little bit tricky. And again, fear not, there is a handout that will take you through all of these steps. which I in fact actually, okay. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do section breaks. And we are gonna break these two sections. So here I am on page five, which is where I'm not supposed to have little Roman numerals and here's page six where I am. So the first thing I'm gonna do is click back up here underneath the abstract. It doesn't matter where you set the cursor, you can set it anywhere you want. Uh, I'm going to come back to the insert tab. Is it going to go to the insert tab? Layout tab. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. I'm going to go to the layout tab. Uh, and you'll see here there's layout breaks. And I hit that drop down menu. I'm going to insert a next page section break, which means that there in the middle, it's going to put a section break and it's going to start the new section on the next page. I click that. And initially, you're like, that didn't do anything. I don't see anything, but it did. And here's how you know. I'm going to double click in the footer again. Now, look what it says it says footer section one, header section two. So we're like, yeah, we got two sections now. This is going to, this is going to be okay. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna break the link that puts this page number over and over. So you notice over here, there's this little box on the right-hand side that says same as previous. We need to get rid of that box. So I'm gonna stick my cursor here. And you'll notice as soon as I do, right here in this middle section, you see this little gray box that says link to previous. That's the one that's going to create all your headaches. Unclick that box. Okay, so now you notice that 
It's not linked to the previous and they're in two separate sections. So now watch this. Now I can go back up to section one and delete that page number. And look, all the little Roman numerals are gone on the front pages. But look, I scroll down to the table of contents and lo and behold, there's the little Roman numeral. So yay, you've gotten your first section break set correctly and life is happy. But now you need to do the same thing again because what the thesis and dissertation guidelines require is you now have to put uh, Arabic numerals in the right corner. Again, I apologize for these people. Like, why do you have to do this? I do not know, but you have to do it. All right, but we know how to do it now. So we come in here into the table of contents page. Again, I'm gonna push, whoops, I don't wanna push it down that far. Don't do that. All right, set in here, come back to layout, do the same process again. We're gonna insert a next page section break. We're gonna check and make sure that sucker broke the way it's supposed to. We can see that it did because here's footer section two, here's header section three. So now we've got three sections in the document. That's the only way to do this with the three different page number styles. Okay, so the first thing I do is I come to the footer. I unclick link to previous, <clears throat> so that's broken. Pardon me. <clears throat> I highlight the page number that I wanna get rid of, backspace it, boom, that puppy is gone. And we check, sure enough, there's little Roman numeral six, and now no little Roman numerals on any of these pages. So that's good. All right, last step. We come up here and we're gonna put page numbers here and we don't want them to go to the rest of the document. So I stick my cursor in the header of section three, unclick link to previous to make sure that none of these page numbers I'm about to put in go to these other pages, click, Okay, now I come back and I put in my new page number. Page number, top of the page, on the right-hand side, like so. Okay, now you see, of course, it's the wrong format and it's the wrong page because your first page is gonna be page Arabic numeral one. So we have to fix two things. Number one, we fix the format. So now we put it in Arabic numerals. And we are going to start, we're going to, under page numbering, we're, instead of continuing from previous section, we are going to start at page one. Okay. Woohoo! There it is. Page one, page two, page three, all the right numbers. This makes us super happy. All right. But, oh no. Our table of contents is wrong now because look, it says there's stuff on pages six and eight and that's not what number they are anymore. But watch this, this is the very best part. So I'm gonna click on the table and I'm gonna click update table. And I'm gonna say update page numbers only because that's all we've changed. But notice if we had changed your headings too, we could change the whole freaking table all at once. And I just click, okay. Boom, fixed. Pretty sweet. All right, last thing on the table of contents is make sure that you format this heading correctly. I'm gonna format this as a heading one. Uh, or do I wanna format? Maybe I don't wanna format that as a heading one because then it'll put it, the, we don't want the table of contents to be in the table of contents. But what I do wanna do is first of all, like you don't want it to be blue. So I'm gonna bold it and I'm change it back to black. And I'm going to fix the crappy spacing yet again. And now it's fixed. And now the great thing is like you can, you'll be able to update your table of contents forever with a single click. You don't have to manually type any of these titles. You don't have to put in any of those page numbers or any of those dots. It's all perfect and beautiful just the way it is. And the additional beauty of this is, is so let's say, for example, I'm going to put a, a, an image somewhere just for the heck of it and pretend it's an actual piece of this project. 
All right, let's put this picture of a dock in just for the fun of it. All right, so there it is. Uh, let's shrink it so it doesn't bump onto that next page. Like so, okay, watch this. So you know that the way that we created that table of contents was that we styled headings. Let's see if that breaks anything. No, nope, that's good. Uh, so we have to figure out how to how to tag the figure captions so that Word knows where the figures are too. All right, so I come in here and I stick my cursor after the picture. And I come back to the references tab. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to insert a caption like so. Okay, so I'm going to call this, uh, sure, figure one colon, because it's always good practice to title your things as well as number them. Uh, Of dock on the lake. Oh, uh, then I can put that in. And then if I want to line it up, hard indented over. Wonder if I can change, if I can make it closer. Yeah, I don't want the 10 points out. Oh, that's interesting. There we go. Okay, so now what's cool is, is that if I wanted to, I can come back, I could come back up here, insert a page break. No, I want a page break, cut that out. There we go. And we know it's right because there's little page number seven, so it's still in the, in the right heading. I click my cursor up here and I go back to references. And notice that the same little box where I did insert caption, it says insert table of figures. So then I get to choose how I want it to look and I can pop it in there. Now, I don't understand, this is a weird thing in Word. I don't understand why it doesn't do list of figures, like why this part is missing, but I'll just go grab this. Stick it in here. And then backspace that up. And now you get the same thing. So no matter how many figures I put in there, it would always know how many there were and what page number it's on and line everything up for you. So again, super easy, so much better than having to do all of that manually. Uh, will Karen asks, will Word automatically number the figures or do you have to do it manually? I think it will do it automatically, but let's check while we're here. Let me scroll down here and let's, we'll stick in another picture and see what happens. Let's put one here. Insert picture. Let's put in. Alien cupcakes, that would be great. <laughs> okay, so there's our alien cupcakes. Let's put in a caption for them. Yeah, see, look, it already knows it's figure two. It knows it's the, the second thing I put in this document. Put that there. Bump it over so it lines up. Oops, wrong tab. Like so. And then again, the beauty, let's scroll back to our, our list of figures. Click on it. Hey, oh, that's not cute. Where, where is my little update table thing? Okay, in, oh, so that's interesting. Look, it doesn't give me the little box the way it did for the table of contents, but up here it's, look at this. Not only does it say update table, it has a little exclamation mark to show me that I need to update the table. So I click that. Uh, this time, because I added a kitchen, I'm gonna update entire table. Boom. 
Oh, maybe it always has the thing. But no, now it said now it's grayed out, so I know I don't have to update anymore. And there's the the figure reference. That was a great question, and it actually helped me find remember a couple of steps that I hadn't put in before. So thank you, Karen. Any other questions about this process? Because seriously, that's actually all there is. <laughs> like once you've done that step, it's over. What other questions do you have? Or Daniela, let me ask you, is there anything that I have not covered that you really want to call people's attention to? Um, here I am. Uh, no, other than as long as they get the page numbering right, everything else is an easy fix. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the page numbering is by far the hardest thing. And remember, it's all about the section breaks. Make sure you put the section breaks in correctly. Make sure that you click that you unclick that link to previous. Those two things are the things that, that screw people up the most. If you will do those two things, everything else is pretty sweet. And you'll be so happy with the time that you did not have to spend on that table of contents when you generate it this way. And then if anybody is, is there anybody that's almost done? I'm almost done. Who are you? Um, Marion. Marion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like if, if you guys are almost done and like she, like Dr. Crawl said earlier, I think it's even before like it gets submitted, you can send it over just for revision and then have that out of the way because there's a certain timeline where everybody just decides that they're just going to send them in and they want answers right there <laughs> and so the easier the faster you get it done the faster you send it in the faster i can get back to you with probably a more thorough answer yeah i, I want to second that which is you know don't hesitate to get in touch with Daniela at any point in this process. Uh, like even if you're just working on the formatting one night and you have a question and you're still not gonna submit it for a couple of months, still go ahead and send her your questions. Uh, Cause that just oh. makes it so much easier for everybody. You're not bothering her, you're actually making her job easier by contacting her earlier. For okay. sure. Um, uh, I don't know how I want to say this. Um, sorry, I'm having a little brain freeze. I don't know how to say this. Um, so graduation, can we talk about that? Sure can. Any confusion with that. Um, oftentimes a lot of people think that if they don't get the corrections done for the dissertation slash thesis, they can graduate and then go on about their lives really you need that approval to go in through ProQuest because then you can't access any of your transcripts or any information that you need to move on without that. So just because you graduate doesn't necessarily mean you get, did I say that okay? Yeah, no, you did. And we mentioned this at the beginning of the workshop, but it, it bears repeating, which is that not completing your formatting check doesn't keep you from getting the degree. The degree will still post to transcript if you met all the other requirements, but you will never get your diploma or be able to get a transcript that shows your degree. And for those of you working on doctoral degrees, that's, that's deadly because for your job materials, they're going to ask you to, sh to show proof of the, either the diploma or the transcript with the degree on it. So do not procrastinate and do not forget to get your thesis, your formatting stuff taken care of so that you can do that upload. You do not want to have your degree in uh, permanent limbo. Like right now, we still, like just as an example, we still have one person that still hasn't done it from two semesters ago. Right, and we don't forget. It doesn't just like, you know, the, your transcript hole doesn't just magically disappear. Physically, we have to right. take it off. So if it's if it's there, it's there forever. <laughs> Great point, Daniela. Thank you for emphasizing that. 
All right, are there any last questions? You guys have been remar remarkably patient. Uh, I know this is a time consuming uh, and sometimes frustrating addition to all the intellectual labor that you did to get through your thesis and dissertation in the first place, for which reason, uh, like I said, Daniela and I are always happy to help you. Nicole, too, when we ask her for her assistance. You're never bothering us. We're always happy to hear from you. We really want you to get your degrees. You've worked so hard to own them. Oh, thank you, Donna. That's very nice. I enjoy doing this workshop. I nerd out about some of the little word things. I'm sure you can't tell. Uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to be, and both Daniela and I, we just want nothing but the best for you and to get what you've earned after all this time. And if there's anything we can do to make that possible for you, you can bet we're gonna have your back, so. I left my email at the very top of the chat if anyone has any questions, just so you don't have to go through a hoop of people, just so they can say you need to contact Daniela. <laughs> right. Thanks, and we'll make sure and uh, share that when we send the handouts out. So at the end of this workshop, all of you will get an email with those three handouts, the, the uh, Word document that you can just type your stuff into, uh, the handout that shows you all the formatting steps that I went over, and then the handout that has the basic information. Uh, I'll continue to hang out here for another five minutes, but if you've got everything you need, feel free to sign off. And again, if you're going to be around for a while, please uh, get involved with the Graduate Student Association. They are here to support you and to uh, make your voice heard at all levels of the university. Thanks very much, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>